in church today. I'm so excited to be here with you. This is the final message in our series, Sex and Sexuality. It's been a two-part series where we've been discussing from a biblical worldview these important, important topics. So if you missed last week's message, you got to get back online and watch Pastor John and Pastor Leslie. They did an amazing job, and today we'll close it out. Now, for those of us that are parents, especially of more than one child, isn't it amazing to see how different our kids' personalities can be? I mean, some of them are like night and day. It's crazy how different their personalities can be. Our firstborn daughter, Haley, she was always the type of kid that was really creative. She'd always ramsack her mom's closet and come outside in her high heels and her necklaces and clothing, sunglasses and purses. She was born to be a fashionista, I think. She was just so creative putting things together. Our second born daughter, Riley, on the other hand, used to only want to play with boys. All the time, there was these little dudes that would come and ring our doorbell from our neighborhood asking Riley to come outside and play basketball. I'm like, dude, she's seven. I, I don't want these boys ringing my doorbell. But she was so much into basketball and baseball, and she only wanted to play physical sports. So my wife and I were so proud of her, we got her involved in women's sports in our town. And I loved it because when she was playing basketball, I gave her a nickname. I called her Shebron James. <laughs> when, <laughs> when she was playing softball, I called her Derek Sheeter. I, I loved it. I was one of those aggressive dads on the sideline with my iPhone out filming everything, saying, post up, Shabron, post up, come on, get all in there, get in the paint, Shabron. And if you thought I was bad, you should have heard my wife. She nearly got dejected from many auditoriums. <laughs> it was so fun watching her, and my wife and I wrote off her affinity for hanging with boys and playing baseball and basketball as just being a tomboy and channeled her athleticism into organized sports. Her love for baseball and her love for basketball was not her identity, just as much as Haley's love for fashion at an early age wasn't her identity either. But for some reason in our culture right now, we're using the wrong things as indicators for our identity. At one point or another in all of our lives, regardless of where we land spiritually, we will have challenges in the area of our identity. For some of us, we'll get attached to our success as a primary indicator of our identity. For others, it could be careers or being a mom or a dad or being in a particular relationship. For some, it's our reputation that becomes our primary source for identity. However, when we base our identity on things like success, wealth, or even physical appearance, those things get us set up for failure because they change over time. They are phases. And what's more recent is that sexuality has now developed into an identity. At no other point in our history as humans were we ever seen exclusively through the lens of our sexual desires. Now, the Bible does talk about sexual desires, and it talks about sexual behavior, but not as sexuality, as an identity. And perhaps this is the reason why we're delving into today a message particularly about sexual identity. I believe that it's one that churches stay away from in general, but it's a place for the church to lead and not to lag. Our culture is in the midst of an identity crisis. People are trying to figure out their issues as it relates to sex and gender. Like never before, the spirit of the world is to make people question their identity from the earliest ages and to conform to any standard that is outside of the things that God desires for us to find fulfillment. It is the same tactic of Satan when he tempted Christ and asked, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. He didn't tempt Jesus in the area of sexuality. He tempted Jesus in the area of identity. And for years and millennia, he's been sharpening his tactic of questioning identity. And I realize there could be a vast difference of opinions in this audience today from people that have made Jesus leader and Lord in their lives and people who aren't sure where they land spiritually or what they believe about the Bible. For some people, the Bible is an archaic tool that is not useful for 
others, we find it to be trustworthy. I think that the greatest atrocity in our times is the death of disagreement. The death of disagreement. So some of us are going to disagree today. And I want to state that I'm speaking to Christians exclusively. I'm speaking to those of us that have made Jesus leader and Lord in our lives. And I understand I've preached about politics in the past, and it's kind of crazy that I'm preaching about sexuality today. And I know that some of you are going to want to email me and communicate and maybe, you know, say a couple of things. So I want you to have my email address. It's here on the screen. No reply. <laughs> No reply from Wade <laughs> at thelifechurch.com. Hit your boy up. <laughs> you know, the Bible's very focused on the matter of identity, and from this posture, it directs us on how to have a healthy perception of our identity in God, which leads us to have the right identity about human sexuality. But because so many Christians have made obedience to the words of Jesus optional and have normalized hypocrisy in our own sexual ethic, it seems as though we can't speak to the broader culture or take a biblical position. And let's just be honest here, everyone. There has been a lot of sexual scandal amongst people of faith and churches and faith leaders. And maybe you're saying today, you should just look in the mirror before you start preaching to anybody else. Well, today we are going to look into the mirror. The mirror is God's word. And God has some things to say to us from his word. And I want to say that mistakes by pastors or leaders or Christians should not make us shrink back to the challenges of our time. We just need to look at the Bible and let the Bible speak for itself. Because the truth is, yeah, we all have the same issues. That's why we need the Savior's identity. We need the Savior's identity. You see, many in our culture today reject the notion that gender is a fixed trait based on biology. Rather, they believe that gender is a flexible trait based on whatever society says. And it's confusing for many of us. It really is because in one way, the culture is like, just follow the science. Go after the science. You can trust the science until we strategically ignore a pretty significant branch of science called anatomy. Anatomy is the branch of science concerned with the bodily structure of humans. And so many people believe that the church is an antique show with vintage ideas about sexuality. And when we express it, it almost seems villainous and vicious. But I want to say that we can be caricatured as backward-thinking people, or we can take a step forward and talk to the culture right from what God says. So, so how do we respond? God spoke to an Old Testament prophet named Isaiah, and I think it helps us frame up the way we have to approach this subject matter because Isaiah says, the Lord has given me strong warning not to think like everyone else does. That's where we have to start. We can't think like everybody else on this matter of sex and sexuality. He says, don't call everything a conspiracy like they do, and don't live in dread of what frightens them, but make the Lord of heaven's armies holy in your life. And if the word holy is triggering for you, let me explain it to you. Holy just means set apart for God's purposes. Not about being perfect, but set apart for God's purposes. See, this issue of sexual identity identity, it is a hot topic, and it's gotten lots of people into hot water. In fact, it feels like we're floating around in a metaphorical hot bowl of alphabet soup <laughs> with letters that keep floating around like LGBTQ plus A, bi, and trans, and cis. All these letters are floating around on conversations, on social media, and our timelines very, every day. In New York, the great state that my wife and I are privileged to pastor in, we have now acknowledged that there are 31 gender identities. 31 gender identities. New York City's Commission for Human Rights led the way by recognizing that people that are gender nonconforming may go by pronouns 
other than he or she, binary pronouns. And so now people are saying they have to be called he, him, his, or she, her, or hers. Some people want to be regarded as they and them or theirs. And there's even gender-free pronouns that don't even fall into these categories. Now, under this policy, business owners and landlords can be fined if they do not use those pronouns for gender non-conforming people up to six-figure penalties for not addressing a person by one of these pronouns. And it's a crime. It is getting really ridiculous about how petty people can even be about being addressed this way. They look at the Bible and say, well, there's a book in the Bible called Hebrews. How do you know it's not she-brews or they-brews or we-brews or coal-brews? Facebook introduced dozens of options for users to identify their gender and even gave a custom gender option. Time magazine calls the focus on transgender identity the next civil rights movement. However, in this conversation, how does it impact all citizens' day-to-day -day lives, regardless of what they believe about God? At a space that we previously rented for our church in New York, there was a sign outside of the bathroom. Maybe you've seen it at airports or at restaurants, and it read this way. Guests may use all facilities based on their sincere, self-reported gender identity. Now, how do we track people's sincerity? So if you're a man, but you sincerely feel like a woman by 12 o'clock in the day, is it okay for you to go in and use a woman's locker room? With no clear direction on how this can be harmful for our citizens, we need to think about the continual erosion of right and wrong. We do. And then let me just put another question out in the ether here. Does God have the right to say what's right and wrong? Can God still direct what's right and wrong? Now, Scripture is silent about being a transgender person. However, hold up, listen to me, everybody. It does speak directly to the broader concept of gender, identity, and sexual behavior. So Paul, a first century leader that started churches and then wrote letters to help them grow spiritually that are now in the New Testament, he was writing to a bunch of believers in a place called Corinth, and they were having trouble in their services. And he says, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. In other words, God is not the author of confusion, but he is the author of clarity. So check this out, everybody. We can't overlook this. God followed a clear pattern of creating and then separating. I call it a complementary cadence or a rhythm to creation. He creates the universe and then separates the heavens from the earth. He creates the light and then he separates it from the night. He creates the waters and then he separates it from the ground. He creates creatures, all the cute fishies and the birdies, and he separates them from humans and from animals. And then we're told that God... God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. That is very clear. Men and women created in his own image. And later in Scripture, we see that God gives humankind the authority to name things, but he doesn't give humankind the authority to rename things. Because whatever we rename, we redefine. So... So heavens differ from the earth, light differ from the night, waters differ from the ground. Maybe this is why God speaks to that same prophet Isaiah that I just quoted. He says, what sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil, and that the dark is light and the light is dark, and that the bitter is sweet and the sweet is bitter. God's like, yo, bro, call an ace an ace. Don't distort what's clear and what I've intended to be different and what I've intended to be distinct. So let me be clear today. God made two sexes, male and female, and ordained a man to leave his parents and join his wife to become one in marriage. Here's what I believe, that your biological sex is a physical trait that's determined at conception. Gender identity is a non-physical trait that develops from birth through young adulthood. Can I go a little clearer? Our biological sex is assigned at conception. 
And while we have a desire to understand things that are so nuanced about the human soul, there are people that are struggling with what's called gender dysphoria, a severe and persistent discomfort in one's biological sex. People that are transgender, they explain it this way, I feel like I'm a man trapped in a woman's body, or I feel like I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. This has to be a tough, tough experience for people going through that. And sadly, many stats put transgender people attempting suicide at a whopping 41%. As believers, we have to be sensitive to this. However, the culture says whatever you feel like, you should just transition to becoming it. Apply surgery or hormone blockers to find your freedom. But let me say something. It's not possible to mistake your biological sex. However, it is possible to mistake your perceived gender. This is where the culture comes in and says, hey, just put hormones in your body. Get a sex change surgery. Your body, your choice. But for those of us with a biblical worldview, it is not your body, your choice. The Bible says, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God. You do not belong to yourself, and I do not belong to myself. If you put your trust in Jesus, your body belongs to him. And to be honest, everybody, what's more irresponsible about this all is the radical agenda to confuse children about their sexuality and push medically and surgically uh, tools to modify their bodies. It's targeted toward children. This is why there's so much curriculum that's trying to be introduced at elementary levels in schools to bypass parents' leadership in discussing this matter. And before you think this is just a bunch of conservative Christians and Christian leaders talking about this, no, there are secular people and that are talking about it, like Dave Chappelle, the comedian who's Muslim, but he's been talking about it. I mean, Bill Maher. Bill Maher, an atheist, the host of real-time HBO, even he's talking about this, and he doesn't believe in God. He tracked it, and he pointed out that there's a massive trend upward in the LGBT population of the United States from less than 1% before 1946 to a whopping 20.85 of Gen Z self-identifying in one of these categories. And he asked, shouldn't we be allowed to question the human race changing at such a previously unprecedented rate? He goes on to joke and say, looking at this chart, all of us are going to be gay by 2054. That's funny. I don't care what anybody's got to say. I, I, I laugh. He's asking, are all babies being born in the wrong bodies? And he says that we shouldn't weigh this as bigotry just because we ask questions about it. He wraps up the bit on his show saying that children shouldn't be allowed to choose their gender identity. And I agree. If you have kids, you know they can barely choose what type of cereal they want in the morning. What you want, Fruit Loose? No, I want Fruit Loose. What you want, Captain Crab? No, I want Captain Crab. What you want, Rice Crab? I don't want Rice Crab. Kids can't choose their gender identity because they don't know what cereal they want to eat. He goes on to bookend his talk saying kids go through phases, the dinosaur phase, the Hello Kitty phase, and they go through the astronaut phase. The next day, they don't even want to leave their room. So what are we talking about being gender fluid? He says, if kids knew what they wanted to be at age eight, the world would be filled with princesses and cowboys. If you don't think that this is a radical agenda, the book that I read to prepare for this message includes some great content written by a person that is not a Christian. It's called Irreversible Damage, and it was pulled from libraries, pulled off of Amazon until a bunch of parents got together and said, we want this book available to everybody. People don't want to hear from the Bible, and they don't want to hear from books, and yet transsexuals are really regretting their surgeries. Many are reverting back to their original sex, 11% of female respondents in one survey said they want to go back to their previous sex. So let me give you three points for those of us that are following along using a mobile device or perhaps you're writing. This is a great time for you to write down some key points to this message. First off, sexuality is rooted in creation. 
Sexuality is rooted in creation. Jesus took the creation account very serious. He quoted Genesis to remind his followers of what they were to emulate. And I love this because they're asking Jesus, an uber group of religious people asking Jesus about divorce. And he just kind of subtly tucks something in there. And I love when Jesus gets a little snarky. I love gangster Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus says, haven't you read the scriptures? And I think that's powerful words because so many of us that are followers of Jesus only read the scriptures on Sunday. It, so Jesus says, hey, haven't you read the scriptures? Why? Because they record that from the beginning, God made them male and female. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Jesus points back to creation strategically. Why? Because the mission of Jesus is to get us back to where there was no sin, <laughs> to God's original design before the fall of humanity. And he says, hey, this is what I'm trying to get you back to. Sexuality, number two, is rooted in covenant. Jesus is also explaining the function for producing a family in this one verse. It begins with God creating man and woman in his own image, two distinct but complementary people made to love, support one another, and get into arguments on date nights. That's, that, <laughs> that's what God has done through marriage, all right? The confusion around identity is intended to distort us from being image bearers. And the last thing is that sexuality is rooted in clarity. Sexuality is rooted in clarity. 31 gender identities in New York, and now a new movement that's saying that a person can have limitless genders, that is not clear. Culture keeps saying that gender should be fluid. And what should we say? Well, my take is as the world is a proponent for gender fluidity, the church has to be a beacon for gender stability. We've got to be stable in our homes and in our families. We've got to be stable when we're single. We have to show an onlooking world what it looks like to show clarity because so many people are confused. So let's land the plane here. Because the truth is, kids that are questioning their sexuality are running to the internet for that to be their mentor instead of running to Jesus for him to be their master. And the internet is giving them a route to becoming whatever they want to be. And we need to be sure that we're helping people. We are not homophobes or transphobes if we bring clarity from the scripture. Track it yourself. Anorexia, cutting, suicide, and even now confusion and sexuality is so attached to the internet recruiting and mentoring people. We all have the same issues. That's why we have to have the Savior's identity. And we are on course of having people make identity decisions that surgery changes and that they can't take back. It's a big deal, everybody. See, most of our culture rejects biblical authority, and instead, science is the king in today's world. But now, even science is becoming slippery for people. It's not enough. And in a culture that's focused on helping people become more transgendered, there's never been a time that's better for the church to help people become more transformed by the renewing of their minds. So again, Wayne, why are we talking about this as a church? It's because people are not believing the Bible and they're not believing biology, but that doesn't mean that we don't continue to speak the truth in love, especially when a female Supreme Court nominate, nominate or now it has been confirmed for judge in the Supreme Court was asked, what is a woman? And she replied, I'm not a biologist. I don't say that as a remark to decry that an African-American woman was appointed to such a high position and that it is historic. But I don't care who was in that position, I'd respond the same way. Whether they were black, white, Asian, or Latino, I would have a challenge on that. You see, in an effort to culturally help people become more comfortable in their skin, we've subtly allowed people to feel more comfortable in sin. And that's everybody, non-Christians and Christians. I'm not biased. I'm coming at everybody today. 
I, 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 I'm trying to help us all. You see, I'm appealing to Christians as a pastor to be more committed to keeping our sexual disciplines within the construct of Scripture. Paul said it this way, but among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy or separated people. We need a renaissance of sexual integrity among Christians before we criticize the culture. What do we do then? What do we do? Here are three ways to integrate this message practically into your week. We still have to hold a biblical worldview with tons of compassion because I think that's where the ramifications lie. We need to look at scripture and we need to look at science because they are not in competition with one another. They're partners with each other to understand things better. But while we look at science and while we look at scripture, we also have to surrender. That's what we need to do. We've got to surrender. None of us understand all the nuances of the human soul. Our hearts are desperately wicked, the scripture says. But when we surrender to God who understands everything about us and knows who we are, we discover that the more surrendered we are is the more we grow into the likeness and the maturity and the stature of Jesus Christ. And then we need to seek God. The attempt of the culture is to make it seem like God is far away and that we should find our identity in ourselves or our sexuality instead of our Savior. But God is not far from any one of us. And if you're in this room or you're watching online and you're struggling with areas of your sexuality, God is not far from you. The scripture says his purpose was for the nations to seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him though he's not far from any one of of us. I can tell you that God is near us in this time of cultural confusion and the spiritual solution is for us to pray like never before, to seek after God in the morning, seek after God in the afternoon and nighttime with our families and with our friends, with our life groups. We've got to get a hold of God, asking him to give us a posture of wisdom to understand our times, that we need tact and we need the right timing and we need the right tone so that we can communicate to a on-looking world, then the last thing is we need sensitivity. We, we, we need sensitivity, everybody. Billy Graham said there are no new sins, only new sinners. There are no new crimes, only new criminals. There are no new evils, only new evildoers. No new pleasures, only new pleasure seekers. And I believe that so many of us, the church needs a baptism of sensitivity and compassion, everybody. These are people that we're talking about. We are talking about people. You can't just write everybody off because of what they do. The Bible does not call people abominations. The Bible calls what people do an abomination. My God, a big difference, a big difference, a big difference, a big difference. And let me just say something else to us. Love doesn't get laryngitis. Some of us feel so afraid to have a position like this because it feels bigoted. It is not bigoted. Respectful Christians won't take sound bites to destroy our friends that are struggling. We don't give the world sound bites. We give the world sound doctrine. And we do that with lots of compassion because people are struggling and they're attempting suicide because they can't figure themselves out. We have to be people that are so compassionate in our tone, so soft in our tone, that people that are far from God but close to us feel the magnetic pull of love. I describe it this way, I am biblically conservative, but I am relationally liberal. I'm gonna love you. I was in Charleston, South Carolina, a couple years ago, and I walked outside of my hotel, and in front of me was this huge battleship in the water. Charleston, South Carolina is beautiful. This huge battleship was out there, and I looked at it for a little while, and then in the distance, I saw this bridge right behind it, and I felt the Holy Spirit speak to me in a very clear way. It was almost like the Holy Spirit said this to me, we can steer a battleship toward the culture, or we can build a bridge for the culture. It's better for us to build a bridge because the world often sees us as a battleship. Can I say something to you? The world would rather cross a bridge than dodge our bullets. And so people, we have to show love. 
And can I say something to you? Because I know that there are some people in this room, maybe watching online, you're going to disagree with what I've preached so far. And that's okay. But can I tell you that love should move in both directions? I'm not a hater because I believe what the Bible says and that I want to lead my family and my church in this way. I'm not hating on you, but I'm going to ask you to return love to me if I disagree with you or anybody else. Because the truth of the matter is we cannot say as a culture that love is just love or love is love. It's a harmful theology. And I'll tell you why. If my kid's running into the street and a Mack truck's coming, it's not loving to leave my kid in the street. It's loving for me to snatch her out of the road. Can I say it this way? Paul, in his epistles, encourages us to be in Christ over 160 times. Be in Christ. Be in the Lord. Be in him. Why? Because inside of him is where we find ourselves fully secure, fully known, and fully loved, and fully cared for. Are you listening to me, everybody? Jesus is the image of his Father. He lived from acceptance, not for acceptance. This is why at the beginning of his life, the Father opens up his voice and lets all of humanity hear, this is my dearly loved Son who brings me great joy. Jesus was never confused because he knew who he was because his Father told him who he was. Can I say it to us this way? Jesus changed the world because his life wasn't about sex. It was about serving. And a celibate man changed the world. Think about that for a second. The Bible is so clear and liberating about sexuality. Think about it. Jesus was fully confident to show a masculinity that would probably be judged today. He cried at funerals. He allowed one of his friends to lay their head on his chest. He always ate brunch with a bunch of dudes. He was at the same place where he showed masculinity by turning over tables in his father's house when he was upset, and he had the trade of a carpenter. In Christ, we are fully known and fully who we should be, and that's why we have to help people. Help all of us because everybody has an issue that we need to submit to the identity of Christ. I was in Switzerland a few years ago with my wife celebrating our 20th wedding anniversary. It was amazing. And as we were walking through Zurich, we ended up walking right into a gay parade. I don't know how you did do that, but we did. And they were marching and they were waving their rainbow flags and we didn't stand in judgment of them at all. I know for many of us, we see that and we just are like, oh, we have such unkind remarks. But I've, I stood there and I remember feeling like the line out of the Wizard of Oz. It seemed to me like people marching down a yellow brick road looking for home, looking for a sense of identity, but not sure how to find it. Next week kicks off Pride Month and around the world. There will be an observance of and celebration of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer lifestyles. And for some people, you'll be triggered by that rainbow. But can I ask you to be triggered by grace? Can, can I ask you to be triggered by prayer? Can I ask you to be triggered by worship so that people that are in this struggle can find their identity in Christ because look, I know rainbows trigger you sometimes, everybody. There's a rainbow that triggers me too. Yeah. I was on this little show many years ago called Reading Rainbow. Triggers me. Take a look, it's in a book, Reading Rainbow. Some of you don't know the song, but if you Google it or if you're on YouTube, you can see me in the Bronx as a teenager selling nail polish in the hood. Not the most masculine thing to do <laughs> in the South Bronx. My friends are like, yo, 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 I, I got that marijuana, you know what I'm saying? I'm walking around the hood like, yo, 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 girl, I got that magenta. <laughs> I was in this class for entrepreneurs where they seeded every student with some money to scale a business. And so I decided I was going to start my business, Wacky Wayne's World of Wet and Wild Nail Polish. You thought I only used alliteration in sermons. Before I was a Christian, I was on some alliteration flow. 
And I started this business because 70% of the people in my high school were women at the time. And I thought, well, I'm going to be a good business person. For those of you that are new, you may not know that my parents are Jamaican and my dad is a Jamaican guy, core, all the way to the core, and Jamaicans are notoriously homophobic. There are songs about homophobia in Jamaica. And so when he learned that his son was selling nail polish, I was worried he's gonna be like, what you selling at school? What, didn't you selling nail polish? Everything all right, boy? But you know what? My dad didn't question my sexuality. He confirmed that I was a shrewd businessman at a young age and he was proud of me. My boy, yes, my boy is selling nail polish. He's making a lot of money at school. I like it, multiple jobs. What am I trying to say to you today? Riley hasn't picked up a basketball or a baseball bat in years. It doesn't matter because she had a father that was affirming her identity, not as a career, not as what she does, but who she is. Can I say something to you today? We serve a God that wants to be near us. Here's a picture of me and my dad. This is from the Reading Rainbow. I should have been convicted for wearing that outfit, those overalls. He should have been mad about that. But what I love is that my dad was so proud of me and he kept walking beside me all the time in a front. Can I just say something to you? Your father is walking right beside you. My God, your father's never gonna leave you. Your father's never gonna betray you. Your father's never, he's gonna let you know that you're my son, you're my daughter, you're my child. I love you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. Listen to me as I close. If you're a parent right now and you have thoughts and questions about your children, maintain a relationship that's godly with influence in your son or daughter's life. Don't make this issue the focal point of your relationship with them. And view this as an opportunity to deepen your intimacy with God. That's what you've got to do. You've got to pray because our sexuality is not our identity. But let me tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away and all things become new. The Bible says all who receive him become the children of God. The Bible says that we are heirs and joint heirs sitting together in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. The Bible says that he is the vine and we are the branches. It says that we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus and that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Come on and let's celebrate the God that has given us an identity. Oh, we all stand up. Oh, we all stand as we as we close, what, what an amazing message. Uh, you know, we like to close each service out each weekend giving an invitation, giving an opportunity. I do wanna say the service isn't over yet, so I know we'll have a chance, don't worry. The lines, it's Memorial Day. No one's gonna be at the restaurant, they're all on the lake. Hey, listen, <laughs> this is seriously, it's one of the most important parts of our service. This is the moment we get to give an invitation. We call it a fresh start invitation. We wanna talk to you about the spiritual condition of your life, where you're at with Jesus. I still remember the moment someone had this conversation with me, it was the best conversation I've ever had and I wanna have it with you this morning. And uh, I, I wanna bring up one of the things that Pastor Wayne said. He, he said a, a little story about what if his daughter was in traffic and she was about to get hit by a car. What love would look like is disregarding everything and running into traffic to, to save her, disregarding the pain that, that we might suffer, putting our life on the line to save theirs. And whether you're online, you're watching this, you're here at Houston Levy, that's exactly what Jesus Christ did for us. Romans says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Do you know what that means? That means that while we not after we got cleaned up or not after we got our lives together, Jesus took an interest in us, but right in the dead smack of your worst day, of your worst moment, the love of Jesus was knocking on the door of your heart saying, I love you, 
I still choose you. I still got a plan for you. There's more for you. You say, I don't know. You don't really know my story. I've been places. It doesn't matter where you've been. His love pursues you. He loves you. I love the love of Jesus because he accepts us as we are. He accepts us right as we are. Never once will you find in the Gospels Jesus saying, hey, come and follow me once you clean up your life and stop sinning and then you'll be good enough. He said, come follow me just as you are. But his love doesn't stop there. It's so big, it continues on to not leave us how he found us. Not leave us broken, not leave us messed up, not leave us depressed and anxious without hope and purpose. See, I'm not just talking about hope for eternity, I'm talking about hope for today and hope for tomorrow and hope for your eternity. So I gotta ask you this question, it's a really simple question. It's the best way to figure out where you're at with God because Ecclesiastes says he put an eternal homing beacon in your heart. Like, what are you talking about? Ecclesiastes 3 says that he put eternity in the hearts of men. That means that somewhere deep down inside of you, I don't need to convince you, you know where you're at with God. You know if you're on track with him or you're off track with him. You know. Well, how do I know? It's easy. I'm gonna ask you a simple question. It's one of the easiest ways to figure it out. Today, if, if you were to go on from this life, where would you be in eternity? If you don't know the answer to that question, today's the day you need to find out. You need to make, you need to make sure. You need to make sure that your heart is right with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, and well, how do I do that? Easy, Romans 10, 9, it says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you are saved. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. So today I have that question for you. Where would you be spending eternity if today is the last day you had on earth? If you don't know, then you need to know. And I wanna give you the opportunity, I wanna give you an invitation today from Jesus to make him the Lord and Savior of your life to the leader of your life. That means you give him the wheel and you say, okay, you're directing this thing. I've done the best I could up to this point and it hasn't worked out well. You take over, I serve you now. So with every head bowed, would you just give some people around you some privacy with every head bowed and eye closed. If you're online, you can do the same wherever you're watching and you're in your car, this is for you too. If you today, say, I want Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life, of your life, then you just raise a quick hand. I'm not gonna have you come down front. All I'm gonna ask you to do is raise your hand for a couple seconds so I know who I'm praying with. Online, you can put a little hand emoji. You can just say, that's me. If you're here at Houston Levy, he's knocking on the door of your life. How long are you gonna avoid this? There's someone in here that you know, that you've, you've heard this before, and, and, and I feel compelled to ask you, how long are you gonna avoid this decision? Because he won't stop knocking on your heart. He's not done with you. He's not done with you. If that's you, raise your hand in this place. I want Jesus today, a fresh start today. Okay, we're all gonna pray a prayer. If you raise your hand, here's all you gotta do. Repeat after me and mean it from the bottom of your heart. And everybody, we're gonna pray in support of those who, who are gonna pray this prayer. Let's all pray this together. Say, dear Lord, thank you for your awesome plan. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross so I can have forgiveness and a new life. I ask you to forgive me, cleanse me, make me new, come live inside of me. Give me the strength to live for you for the rest of my life in Jesus' name. Come on, amen and amen. Let's put these hands together. Angels are rejoicing in heaven. Let's go.